Yes, John Hudson is back for another edition of the Unbiased UFO Report. And, John, a lot of interesting things happening. I, I don't know if you caught earlier on today where on uh, the theories of everything, Lou Elizondo gave his longest Ask Me Anything. Yes, I know. I still need to, I still need to get caught up on that. There were so many other things going on. I didn't even have a chance to catch it live, so it should be interesting. Great show. I recommend anybody uh, go watch Kurt. Uh, Jai Mungle, and he does a great job with Lou and uh, you know what it, it's very good very good uh, programming very interesting uh, programs I, I think Lou's starting to loosen up a little bit you know yeah He's starting to loosen, yeah. which is nice because we yeah. need that but his old teammate little Tommy DeLong is back in the news did another UFO interview again you know I'm I'm, I'm honestly I'm getting surprised that he's speaking UFOs so much again lately. Something well, was well, in, in this case, he didn't really have a choice in the matter. Um, he was being interviewed by uh, this gentleman named Ted Stryker, who they seem to have known each other for some time. They seem to have some kind of a, of a back end friendship. I and the impression I got is it is it Ted Stryker was a um, was a disc jockey, it was a DJ at, at some point when when Tom was recording uh, Blink One Eighty Two, and so I think that's how they know each other. And uh, and so the the whole interview um, was actually about music. It was all about angels and airwaves. Um, but um, you know, pretty short into the interview, immediately, you know, uh, you know, uh, Ted uh, Ted Stryker starts asking him, you know, what about the UFOs, right? And you know, of course, Tom can't turn down that opportunity. And uh, and so basically, Tom and him talked about it for about uh, about eight minutes, uh, eight minutes and change, and. Um, and so what I did, because I figured out you know, most of the you know pushing of this of this uh, interview would be based on the music. I I basically trimmed out those eight minutes and posted them up on on Twitter as um, four two minute uh, clips. Um, you know, made sure to give you know Ted Striker a lot of credit because he did a good interview. And uh, and so there'll be a link to that, so you guys can all check it out. But the reason why it's worth mentioning is because um, one of the th first off, Tom was um, uh, you know Tom was Tom was the new version of Tom. You know, he 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 played it. Uh, it was a very clean dialogue that he played. He didn't, um, you know, he he caveated a lot of stuff. He you know he played down things. You know, saying hey, you know, we don't know this and we don't know that and and so forth. And so that was all good. Um, but what he specifically talked about was the army crata, uh, crata, and which is something we're all very curious about. And uh, most of what he talked about is stuff that anyone who's been studying this carefully is already aware of. Um, you know, that this is um, 80 something layers. Um, the, the material being studied is something like 80 something layers of, of, of different material that, um, you know, that, that it's still in study, that there is a current hypothesis that it has something to do with frequency. Um, you know, my best evidence on that is, is um, uh, how put off um, indicating that he believes that it might be a waveguide for terahertz, uh, 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 terahertz frequencies. Waveguide is just basically something that will direct the the waves to another place and or and, and divert it in this in a slightly different direction um but the one part that came out that i wasn't aware of was that he talked about the fact that there is a chain of authority on the material however it does not go back to its original founding it only goes back a couple hops and so there is a large gap in its in its chain of authority but even with that said they have every reason to believe that this material was recovered in uh, new mexico in the 40s However, it is at least what, what Tom DeLong said was that he does not believe it was from Roswell. Um, you know, anything is possible, but that's not his understanding. He does not believe it's from Roswell. And so it was just it was good to hear that, you know, that Tom's still very invested in the Creta, um, that he's still that, uh, you know, the, the current version of TTSA is still actively working with the army on the Creta and that they're still making progress. So I thought that was good news. Well, I mean, he's got to save face of this somehow. You know, I mean, that's a big blow when you lose two thirds of your dream team. It's a big yeah. Blow. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that um, I don't know. I'm going to be really interesting. I'm going to be really interested to see how this whole thing gets written out in in ten years because um, I I don't know. I I I think that that Steve Justice leaving that was and that that was an unfortunate result of of the financing. Um, but I, part of me is getting this this sinking suspicion that um, that uh, Louis Elizondo and uh, and Christopher Mellon leaving 
um, might not have come at the exact time it was originally expected, but might have actually been planned. Um, we'll see. Um, and um, because what I'm starting to realize is that a lot of what Elizondo and Mellon have been doing since they left, they couldn't have done with TTSA. It wouldn't have worked. There's no way it would have worked. And um, and maybe there was a hope that someone else would take it on, but I'll be curious to see how that happens. But I mean, let's face it, all Tom ever really cared about was the entertainment business because that's all he knows, you know? And so, uh, and they did talk about his um, um, his movie, which um, is basically right now, uh, it's in the can, it's done. And they're basically just negotiating with um, distributors uh, for a theatrical release. So right now they're looking at probably early 2022. That's going to be interesting to see. Now, in Washington, D.C., there was some very big news where Robert Salas, the man behind the story of UFOs and nuclear missile silos, really got down to business with a press conference. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and not only did it go very, very well, I haven't checked myself, but my understanding is, is that it's, it's all online and that, that anyone can watch it. And if you find it and you have a chance to sit down and watch it, I highly recommend it. The, the little clips that I've seen have, have been quite impressive. And um, what I loved was that um, essentially um, uh, the gentleman's name is, um, what was it again? He's a writer for military.com. Um, but basically, uh, uh, Travis Tritton, um, uh, basically wrote for military.com and he's the one that wrote this article that I, I mainly used for, for this report on, on what happened. And he wrote a really good article and it was, it was well presented. It covered a lot of good information and specifically focused on, um, three individual stories. Um, in light of time, I can't go over all of them. They'll all be in the notes. You guys can read them, but there is one I would like to just cover briefly. And that is that of a, of a gentleman named Robert Jacobs. And Robert Jacobs was a first lieutenant in the Air Force, had been stationed at uh, Vandenberg, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California in 1964. And in 1964, while at Vandenberg, he was asked to set up a telescope camera to essentially film a Atlas rocket test. And when he started filming, what he claims is that a disc-shaped craft flew up to the rocket and I've heard this story before, but I've never heard it directly from him. And I'm sure you've heard it as well, Dave. Uh, this is this is a, a pretty famous story. Um, flew up to the rocket and circled the rocket and then began firing a beam of light, several different beams of light at the rocket, um, even getting above it and shooting the beam of light right into the into the to the you know dummy warhead of the rocket. And um, uh, and then basically it took off out of frame. And uh, as soon as it was all said and done, um, he was basically told uh, two men came up um, in suits and basically asked for the for mm -hmm. the film. And he was warned uh, to never speak of it again. And he didn't for for a very, very long time. And uh, that's that's boy, man, that's one hell of a story. No kidding. No kidding. Now, Robert Salas, you know, this is one of those stories, my friend, that has literally been out for decades. And the one thing that has, you know, kind of irked me a little bit regarding this whole uproar, uh, UFOs and nuclear weapons, is that how blind everybody it was is acting towards it. Like, oh, it's new? This was happening? Like, we've known for for 40 years, Robert Salas has been, you know, and good on him for never giving up on this topic, you know, so but I, true Dave, and, but you know what? I feel bad for him because for years he was hounded as a conspiracy theorist. He was hounded as uh, somebody who obviously lost it. And that's why they aren't in the military anymore. And he went through the entire rigmarole of being defaced and dehumanized over this topic. And now here we are. And, you know, it all started a couple of years ago with the unidentified television show by the TTSA, where all of a sudden they were acting like, oh, my gosh, we had nukes over nuclear weapons silos. And everybody know. acting like it's brand new. I know. And, and the thing is, is that what this what this says to me is that there was a um, there was a, a, a subconscious in, 
intentional uh, dissonance of a way that I think a lot of people who may have heard this story before, they, they just ignored it because of the level of fear that it brings. I mean, these are not easy stories to hear. I mean, Salas's own story, you know, basically he saw 10 nuclear silos go out at once. Like these are silos that aren't even interconnected, right? They're, they're, they're not supposed to have any relationship to each other whatsoever. So there's, there's really, there, there shouldn't actually technically be a way to shut all 10 of them down at the same time, right? Because of the way they're wired. And essentially these 10, like, I mean, essentially if, if the president had ordered a launch at that point, they would have had to say, sorry, we can't, right? And, uh, and that's to me, and then I also think it really speaks to, well, I credit Robert Salas and, and everyone else involved who were involved in that last press, um, uh, press event uh, back in, uh, uh, bu a bugger, I don't remember what year it was, but it was a while ago now. It really shows how, how few people heard it, you know, yeah. and how, how few people were exposed to it, how, 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 how dampening the suppression of this information really is how drastic the media's um, the media's lack of interest in it really is that that a story this powerful and this serious and what actually justifies for one like the only thing in my mind that justifies the fear talk right the only thing everything else is yeah. like what well, you know I this is the it. one thing that justifies it right and they didn't talk about like no one talks about it. Well, if I if I recall one of the stories that was told was that these UFOs actually hit the launch buttons on these missiles at the so, exact same time as they hit these another pack of UFOs hit the launch buttons in Russia and they had to get on the phone with each other and say this isn't us. Well, no, my, well, I I I I need to look into this. I've been meaning to do so cuz my understanding of it was was that it was even worse than that. It was they shut down ours and launched theirs that 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 basically that, that, that there was another there might have been another time where ours were triggered as well but my understanding was at the time that the yeah. russians were triggered that ours were shut down so it was like it was like they were intending for us to get decimated right and but you're dead on essentially there had to be communication between the two the two countries to essentially avert a a serious launch because um you know, uh, um, you know, yeah. I mean, but I mean, how do you handle that? How do you handle it when, when the military of a of a of an, of an adversarial country calls and says, "We are in a launch countdown. We didn't trigger it, and at the moment we can't stop it. And if it goes off, our bad. We're sorry, right? I mean, <laughs> what do you do with that, right? I mean, it was a horrible, a horrible situation. No, very, very much so. And you know, I just don't like how it got downplayed, and Robert Salas got downplayed even through the last few years. I mean, all of these young UFO researchers now are like, wow, this Robert Salas guy had it going on. Like he was yep. there, you know, yep. and he didn't have a lot of people having his back on that. So no, it, it really is good to see. John, I'm going to keep you around here a little bit because honestly, my, my voice is going. Yeah, it's all good. So yep. I, I do apologize. No, no, no. It's all uh, good, my friend. Well, I'm going to apologize publicly to Shirky Poo because she prepares a great newscast each and every night. And I know if I get reading on my own for a few minutes, I'm going to lose my voice here. Yep. Yep. No worries. No worries. No worries. Yeah, I can feel it starting to slide away. But yep. uh, regarding uh, this, what came out of this? What what came out of this whole uh, Robert Salas? So, so I, I would argue that as of yet, nothing. Um, that as of yet, nothing. However, you do have people like... Um, 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 uh, Christopher Mellon um, uh, putting out some social media, uh, you know, tweets specifically referencing the event, referencing the the you know the honorable and the the courageous you know actions of these of these individuals. Um, you do you know you had, you had military.com writing about them, right? Which is you know I mean that's that's a widely read you know more baseline periodical. And so that's, that's a good place for them to be writing about it. And, um, and I do think that it's, it's very helpful now that, you know, and, and Robert Salas even talks about it in the in an interview he did, where he talks about the fact that he basically believe he credits the Nimitz event with why people are now starting to take him more seriously. And, and he says, look, you know, it's, it's because Congress is now actually taking action 
on what they're seeing in the skies that now people are coming back and going, oh, wait, maybe those Air Force guys weren't all that nutty, you know? And so it's basically helping his credibility. And so he, he seems pretty confident that at this point, essentially what it comes down to is we need their testimony logged into the record. Right. At this point, they've been testifying on the side and no one's been logging what they've done. And we need their testimony formally entered into the record and, and formally reviewed by Congress. And and I don't know how fast that will happen, but it needs to happen. All right. Finally, here's we got a couple minutes left. Uh, Lou Elizondo questioning whether or not he may have fibbed on the money for ain't it? Yeah. OK, so so. OK, so I, I just want to caution everyone that, that if you have strong feelings about what I'm about to talk about, and, and some people do, um, this may come off as me um, you know, playing down something that you consider serious. OK, but I just have to be honest that because of the work I've done with the government, I just I, I don't feel that way. But essentially what it comes down to is, is that um, it, there's all this confusion about ATIP and, and, and OSAP. Right. And so this is one of the reasons why I've started declaring a, a, a a primitive along with each of them in that I refer to, to OSAP as, as DIA OSAP. Um, and then within DIA OSAP, there was DIA OSAP TTSA. I mean, I am uh, a tip. And, and then essentially when, when OSAP, you know, ran out of money, um, a tip was essentially moved over into OU, uh, OUD, um, OUDSI. And so that became OUDSI. Uh, a tip. And so to me, I, I have to declare this because there's so much confusion going on as to where things fit and so forth. But what it really comes down to is, is that what this means is that a tip OUDSI never actually got any money ever. Right. Basically that 22 million went to DIA OSAP. They got the money. And from what people can see in the record books, because a lot of this stuff is documented because it wasn't the secret program, all that money was spent right? They actually spent all that money. They actually bought some very high-end gear. And um, and so that money was spent. So then the question becomes, well, then what was a tip under OUDSI? Was it just, um, you know, uh, was it just like, you know, uh, Lou Elizondo went to his boss and said, hey, I have this passion project I really care about. And, but don't worry, it won't take any time for my normal job. Do you mind if I take it on? And they're like, yeah, do whatever you want in your free time, sir. You know I mean? Was it just this kind of like, you know, really, you know, just weird, like, you know, because I mean, I've, I mean, let me say I, I've been in, in companies where I did about 40% of my job so that I could then do the 60% of the job that I cared about, right? Um, and that 40% that of my job was what I was actually measured on, right? And 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 what 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 my manager thought was important, right? And but the 60% of what I did, that's what I cared about. And that's what I felt was important for the company, right? And I've been in that situation. I'm gonna, I can't tell you how many times. And so, you know, I don't think it means that that it was just a a, a meaningless project that that didn't have any weight to it. But um, I think the big problem here is that when you are in an organization like the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense um, Intelligence, uh, I, I shouldn't say money's never a problem, but Money is rarely a problem. It, it all comes down to how important something is and how many eyes it has on it. And they have multiple, multiple funding vehicles available to them um, that, you know, some might consider to be kind of slushy money, you know. Um, and a lot of these groups have gotten in trouble for it. I mean, uh, uh, um, 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 not uh, Department of Energy, but uh, the NRO got in trouble for this several years ago. They had a they had a little kitty of like six billion dollars that they had saved up on their own. They weren't telling anyone about, and, and they were using that for for they build use it to build a new um, headquarters. And so this stuff happens. And technically, it, is it illegal? I I don't know what the what the funny money part of it is. But the, what I'm getting to is that I think that that the way a tip in OUDSI got funded is very normal. It's very common. It's very practical. It was basically funneled by, you know, non-appropriated money. And essentially because of that, no one can talk about it because you don't want to draw any spotlight on how, you know, pet projects within the, within OU to get funded. And so Lou can't explain why it got funded. Lou can't explain how he funded that project when he didn't get any of that 22 million. But because of that, a lot of people are saying, well, wait a second, if 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 ASAP got, if OSAP got the money and you didn't get the money, are you lying about it? You know. Well, so I mean, so his credibility gets thrown into play by some people, but in my opinion, 
it's not yeah. terribly a big issue. John, thank you for helping me out tonight with a extra long unbiased UFO report. Really do appreciate it.